This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, so we are going to start. Um, thank you for being here. I'm Superintendent Mike Morris of the Amherst Pelham Regional Schools. On behalf of the school committee, who you hear from in a little bit, we really want to thank people uh, for attending today's four town meeting. Just have some typical business to do at the beginning. It's a little different than typical business we usually do when we're upstairs at the middle school. But uh, I want to uh, let people know that I want to thank Amherst Media for waking up early on a Saturday morning uh, and being here. It is being shown right now, streamed to uh, online, so anyone can access the meeting as well as being shown on channel 17, uh, Amherst Media channel 17 in Amherst. So thank you Amherst Media for doing that. I wanted to let everyone know that that was happening. Um, and uh, before we get into some of the logistics, uh, we're not gonna do a roll call vote because with this many boards and people, I think it would, it would just, it's impractical. Uh, but I'm gonna go town by town just if people wanna call their, uh, if they have a quorum, call their representative boards to order. Uh, and we'll go in reverse alphabetical order today just to mix it up a little bit. So I'll start with Shootsbury. Uh, so for folks from Shootsbury, are there any quorums of elected officials present on the call? Today? Yes, yes, the Shootsbury Select Board has got a quorum, so I'll call the Shootsbury Select Board to order. And, and yes, the, the Shootsbury Finance Committee has a quorum. We'll call that to meeting in order. Great. I'm guessing the school committee probably does not in Shootsbury, um, but if I'm mistaken, someone can pipe in and let me know I'm wrong. Okay. So then we'll go to our good friends in Pelham, Mr. Tricky. Uh, there are no quorums uh, in Pelham today. Okay. Very good. And in Leverett then? The Leverett School Committee has a quorum. We'll call that meeting to order now. Great. Any other boards or committees have quorum in Leverett? Leverett Finance Committee can call to order. Great, thank you, Ann. Any other, anything else in Leverett? And then I will go to Amherst. Um, I can look at Ms. McDonald, because I think I do see a quorum of, of our committee. Yep, um, we, we, um, as far as I can tell, we have full attendance from the regional school committee, so I'm calling to order the meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. I think you, you, know, you all have one other committee to at least- Sorry, to be to um, and I'm calling to order this meeting of the Amherst School Committee. Thank you. Sure, Ms. Griesmer. Um, Mike, could we identify the people who are on the phone? Because we have six. Oh, that's a good point. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I do see a number of people on the phone. I think I see two. So um, you're on the phone to identify uh, who you are and what town and what role you're playing. Steve Nagy, Leverett Finance Committee. Thank you, Steve. Um, and I see one other number on the uh, call who's a, uh, one other person on the call who's a phone in. I'm not sure, Lynn, then uh, how, to, how to help with that. Okay, right. Julie Shively from Leverett, can you hear me now? I can. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if Tom Hankinson is in, is in the meeting, but if he is, then we have a quorum for the select board. If he isn't, I guess we don't. Um, I do not see him in the call. Okay. So, Lynn, do you want to hold on? Your, you're more certain. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. So, uh, again, before we get into details, um, I just want to do a little bit of um, Google Meet orientation. I know some people are more familiar than other people with it. Um, the sort of four things that I want to go over. One is if you uh, want to see, we have 45 people on the call. 
and if you would like to see all of them, um, you can click. There are three buttons on the lower right. And if you click on those and go to change layout, something will come up. And I see that there's a hand up. I'll get to it in one second. And if you click on tiled, probably the default one. At the bottom, if you scroll all the way to the right, where it says the maximum number of tiles, you'll get it'll let you scroll all the way or click and drag, I should say, all the way to 49. And if you choose to do that, you can see everybody very small boxes. Uh, you don't have to do that, but I know some people like seeing everybody in the room, and so you can you again don't need to do it, but if you do like to see everybody, that's the way to do it. Um, I see there's a hand, so the next thing I was going to go over, Lauren, was actually about how to raise hand, and you've already showed how that works, but why don't you go ahead. Uh, shoots for a school committee, now is a forum. Great. And Ms. Breeze, um, uh, I think Dorothy just joined the meeting. I don't know if that pushes you to quorum. It does, and so I would like to call the town council of Am the Amherst Town Council to order. So the second thing I want to go over is I'd request that unless you're presenting uh, or speaking, that you mute yourself. Um, so the way you do that is if you look at the kind of center of the bottom, uh, there is a little microphone button. Like I just did. And if you if it's unclicked, it won't be. The other sneaky way, sneaky fast way is if you do control D, that'll let you toggle on and off from being muted or unmuted. Um, so if you're a po point and click person, click on the microphone. If you like the shortcuts and you're on a computer, control D will let you uh, mute yourself or not mute yourself. Um, the third thing I was going to go over, which Lauren just showed, is there's a raise hand feature. Given the number of people on the call, I think for the rest of the call, if people do want to jump in and there'll be lots of opportunities to do so, um, if you look towards the bottom of your screen, there's an icon of a raised hand. It says raise hand under it. Uh, if you click on it, you can see that the hand goes up. Uh, hopefully, you can see that on my screen. Um, and Dr. Slaughter, myself, will be able to track that, and we'll try to go in the order that we see raised hands. I think just given the size of the group, it'd be hard if people are um, jumping in uh, without using that mechanism. Um, the last one, and perhaps most important one, we don't need it now, and maybe we'll hold to, to Dr. Slaughter's presentation. There's a way to what's called pin something. And if you, what that allows you to do is make one thing cover either most or all of your screen. Uh, certainly, you don't need to do that for me right now. You can look at my office, which is way, way less cool than some of the backgrounds I'm seeing in other people's. Um, Sarah Best is always my favorite. Sorry. Uh, she did specifically for the pandemic and painting and lovely background. Um, but at some point when Dr. Slaughter is presenting and there's lots of numbers on a screen, it's going to be pretty important to be able to uh, look, you know, that presentation was, I think, emailed yesterday by Dr. Slaughter uh, to some folks, but I think as we're following along, uh, when we get the presentation up, we can pin that. If you want to try it now, you certainly can. If you hover over anybody, um, just put your mouse uh, over anyone, could be yourself. Uh, you'll see, uh, like, looks like, a, to me, a thumbtack. Uh, if you click that, uh, it says pin to screen, and it will show up larger, um, so it's more visible than everything else. Um, and so I think it is going to be something that is useful for you um, later in the meeting. I don't think it's, it's super useful now. Um, but I wanted to just preview that because I think later on we'll, we'll be talking about it. The last thing I mentioned a little earlier was about breakout rooms. Um, there was an email this week um, from Sasha Figueroa asking uh, towns to set up their own breakout room. Uh, we thought that that might be a better way uh, if, if a town is struggling with that, uh, please let me know. We certainly can do one for you. It just seemed like, you know, people, it, it, may, it made sense to us that each town would have their own uh, unique breakout room that they could use. Um, lastly, this is an instruction, just acknowledgement that uh, our state representative, Mindy Dom, is here. Thank you, Mindy, for being here. Appreciate it. And State Senator Joe Comerford is here. So thank you, Joe, so much for joining us. We know you've been doing uh, tremendous work at the State House on uh, you know, the current fiscal year, as odd as that sounds, um, and, uh, you know, got to the end point, it sounds like, this week of um, working between the House and the Senate. 
So we're, we're deeply appreciative of your ongoing support. And, and you know, Mindy was, uh, Joe, excuse me, was emailing me this morning with, have you seen this? And, you know, that's the kind of support we get from our legislators. Uh, we are kept in the loop. You know, our school committee certainly is very active in reaching out and advocating on, uh, on all of our behalfs, our towns, our schools. And so we just appreciate your responsiveness and spending a Saturday morning with us because we know how busy you all are. So thank you both for being here. Um, I think um, we did a call to order just going down my list of things. Um, so I want to, the same thing I say uh, every year is this is a public meeting, but it is not, there's no public comment on the agenda. There will be no votes taken. It's an opportunity for the towns uh, and the school district to share uh, fiscal realities, um, both from the school side and the towns. This is the first of multiple four town meetings this year. Uh, the short preview I'll offer is that it's, it's highly likely uh, that we may need more than two four town meetings this year because of the complexity of the situation we find ourselves in. Some of that's COVID related. And as you're gonna see, some of that's just, you know, there's new EQV and values change. And some years the relationship between the towns fiscally works better. And some years it works worse. And the short story is this is not one of the years it works better. Um, through no one's fault. It's just when we plug in the formulas with the updated information and enrollments, uh, some years it, it sort of evens out and smooths out between the towns and some years uh, it leads to some disparities that need lots of discussion. And, and this is really one of those years. So the combination of having less certainty uh, for very understandable reasons on the state front in terms of the next fiscal year, uh, as well as having some challenges um, that are unrelated to COVID and unrelated to uh, the state, probably are going to require us to have some additional meetings this year. So uh, not that anyone wanted to hear what I just said, but I figured I'd want to preview that at the beginning so everyone was aware of that. I think at this point, I'd love to turn to Allison McDonald, who's the chair of the Regional School Committee, who I know also wanted to offer a brief welcome before we get into the details. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, and I, I'll just echo, I think, a uh, sentiment that Dr. Morris expressed earlier on. Um, really, really deeply appreciative of everybody um, coming on this dreary Saturday morning. Um, this, uh, this is an unprecedented year of, of challenge and um, the challenges are not insignificant or few. Um, and I really am appreciative that this many people are um, committed to quality um, public education in our communities and are willing to give so much of our time um, to that effort. So thank you very much for um, being here today. Thank you, Allison. And, and for some people, it's raining. And as we heard earlier, some people, it's snowing right now. So uh, we're glad that we're in a virtual environment because the drive back up the hill might have been a pretty tough one for some folks uh, at, at 1030 or 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, last kind of ground rules we've, we've held to in the past is we will end this meeting by 11 o'clock. I, I actually think today there's a high likelihood we'll end well before 11 because the information we have today uh, is so preliminary and there's there's more variables than normal. This is a typical timing, early December, when our four towns would get together, uh, but the number of variables is much greater now than it typically would be. So uh, we're viewing this as an initial snapshot, initial dialogue, uh, then to be followed up with much more uh, conversation as we head into the new year. Uh, and my last introductory comment, I know no one came today to hear me uh, talk, but I do want to really thank the region, the four towns, for continuing to come up with compromises, continuing to support our regional schools. It's, it feels like this is my fifth year in the job. It feels like every year there's some new, uh, new thing that we're managing, a uh, new financial element we haven't thought about before. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, it's never been easy. It continues to be harder and harder uh, in many ways. And yet I really want to appreciate all the work that everybody has done uh, to come from their town's perspective, as they rightfully should, uh, but to come together to support a regional school district that um, is performing very highly, has very good ratings from external um, bodies, uh, and that's only because of the support of the four towns. Um, I think I do see, before we get into sort of the meat of the presentation, I think I did see a couple hands go up, or at least one. Um, Darcy, did I see your hand go up? And if so, you, you know, you can certainly jump in. I just put my hand up because I'm off camera, but there's no indication that I'm here. Um, I see you. Um, you, oh, know, you do? Or maybe we can see ourselves? That's a setting that you can control locally, whether you see yourself or not, right? And there's no judgment or no statements about whether that's... <laughs> <laughs> 
something that's advisable or inadvisable. Uh, I've gotten some feedback that some people love not, they, they only see themselves in a tiny screen in the upper right hand corner. Uh, and they, uh, they, they appreciate that. Uh, other folks, uh, you know, would like to see themselves. So that's actually, without getting into too much detail, that's a local setting that you can set on your own computer, whether you want to see yourself in the grid or you prefer not to. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Darcy. And I saw uh, a question come through in the chat about the presentation email. Then once I turn it over to Doug, uh, I think I should be able to you know, email that same listserv who got the invitation with the presentations. That's no problem at all. Are there any other, before we get into, again, the, the majority of the agenda, which is looking at financial projections for next year, and uh, are there any other clarifying questions before we, I turn it over to Dr. Slaughter, and uh, he runs through some slides. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, you know, I think the last thing I didn't mention before is, I think there is the chat feature, uh, which um, has been used a couple times. If you want to use that, towards the top upper right-ish of your screen. Uh, there's a little icon that um, has three lines across it and that allows you to chat. Uh, my recommendation is we only use chat how it's been used for clarifying information. You know, could we get this presentation? This is the shortcut. I think for content-based dialogue, my, my request is that we, we use the old fashioned way and we raise hands and we do that orally uh, and not get into uh, something where the content of the presentation is, is done on chat. So if that's agreeable to everyone, I hope it is. Uh, if it's not, please, you know, you can raise your hand, but the norm I would like to set is chat is for purely informational pieces, not for, for content or real discussion. So for those of you who are the first time at the Fort Town meeting, uh, the, typically how it works is the finance director, in this case, Dr. Slaughter, will go through uh, an update on financials, uh, both in terms of operating budget and capital with anticipated needs and requests. Uh, there's clarifying questions at, at delineated points. Uh, and then at the end, each town is able to go into its own meeting uh, to talk about from its only its own perspective. We come back uh, today. We're not asking for any decision, um, but we, uh, you know, we want to come back and just let people be able to share what they want to share. We have received public guidance um, emails from the town of Leverett not to exceed a 1.5 percent financial increase uh, percent increase and from the town of Amherst um, to be flat in terms of the assessment that is being requested. These I know are initial, um, but you know, as we typically do, we shed those publicly so that the other towns are aware. Uh, consistent with past practice, Shutesbury and Pelham has not sent, sent us specific uh, guidance in that way. That comes more organically in those communities through discussion and dialogue at four town meetings and with their finance committee and select boards. With all that said, 19 minutes in, sorry, Doug, uh, I'll pass it over to Doug Slaughter. Uh, I'm going to just take one minute to email this presentation out to the group, which can take me about 90 seconds. I'm sure Doug can fill that with some background information before we start, start showing slides. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Um, good morning and welcome to everyone. Uh, I've been in these meetings for a number of years, typically in a different role, having uh, served on select board members before the changing government uh, and on its finance committee previous to that. And so um, I've, I've been in your chairs, as it were, and so I appreciate your time and effort to, to come in and listen. Uh, to us uh, sort of paint the picture this year. Um, I'll just reiterate uh, from what uh, the superintendent just said that, that uh, <clears throat> this is preliminary. There's a lot of open questions. Uh, no one's fault, no one's uh, you know, lack of due diligence. Uh, it's just the nature of the circumstance we find ourselves in. And so we're trying to give you an order of magnitude sort of sense of, of where things sit at the current time. Uh, so you can start thinking about it and, and have uh, some information as you start to go through the process of constructing the budgets in each of your towns and thinking about how you're going to support our schools. Um, so I'll, I'll start with that. But just to lay out the agenda a little bit, uh, that's actually the first slide. I'll, I'll first talk about sort of what we think is going to happen revenue-wise, things that are coming into, uh, in, into our schools to help support our budget. Uh, then I'll talk about what we think is going to happen relative to expenses. Um, then we'll we'll get into some scenarios around assessment methods a little bit. Um, then I'll get into capital and, and sort of explain that. That'll be the more straightforward piece. Um, and then we'll have an opportunity to, to discuss uh, at some length, you know, sort of where each of the towns uh, sit relative to their budgets and, and what we've presented to you. Um, <clears throat> so Mike, if you advance actually two slides to the, to the third, one in the slide. Uh, I want to make sure, check in on two things. One is, I'll do that in a second, but this is the time when we talked before about pinning, where if you do hover over 
the presentation, it should give you the option to pin to the screen, uh, and that's going to make the presentation more visible. Uh, taking the suggestion, it's also been emailed to everybody who received the invitation to this meeting, so if it's easier to follow uh, in any direction, you can, but I just wanted to do the tech minute for a second. Uh, but Doug, I'll, I'll go ahead to this slide. Yeah, that's the one. So uh, the superintendent mentioned this earlier. Uh, this is an outside rating agency. It's uh, niche.com. You know, they rank school districts. And so the good news, I'll start with the good news today. Uh, we have a very, very good school district. Um, we should be proud of that. And it takes a lot of work and effort to, uh, to make that happen by a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. Um, and so that, you know, we still continue to have a very, very good, good school system. And I think the thing I've been thinking about recently in, in working through the numbers and stuff is, is that uh, we're always in a state of change. Um, you know, whether we're, you know, working within financial constraints or, or financial opportunities, or we're trying to advance the way and what we teach and how we teach uh, the children of our, our communities, uh, we're always in an evolving modality. And so we're, we're trying to get uh, better at what we do, and we're trying to do that in a financially responsible way. And so uh, we've had success, obviously, as, as demonstrated on this slide, but we're gonna continue working and, and continue to try to get better. Um, next slide, please, Mike. And so we have a vision for our schools. This is a slide, I didn't write this slide. Mr. Mangano wrote this last year. I think it excellently captures what we're trying to do here. We're trying to be cooperative in our process. We're trying to have a lot of opportunity for our children uh, and, and do it in a way that, that we can afford and, and is, is uh, cost conscious as well as uh, you know, creating a, a series of programs that kids uh, want to participate in and, and get a lot of uh, rich uh, educational experience from. And so this is, this is sort of what uh, is our uh, foundational or, or uh, uh, centering, you know, philosophy that helps guide us whether we're working on it from a, a educational side or a financial side. Um, so next, I'll step into our uh, financial, uh, our revenue projections for next year. So next slide, please. Hold on, if we could hold for one second. Yeah. Um, so, so two things. One is I just want to note, uh, and I know Dr. Slaughter will in a minute um, that it's been, you know, the challenge has been that two of the last three fiscal years have been particularly hard for the regional schools. We appreciate the four towns coming together, but maintaining the vision in an era of um, significant budget, budget reductions has been uh, been a challenge. So I think I don't want to go to the negative place, Doug, but I also just want to reference that it's, um, we have had to make reductions in like child study uh, program, which no longer exists at the school and some more home ec and, and some other programs um, cooking that, that no longer there. We've done that through efficiencies, um, but it is a challenge. The other thing I want to stop you is I believe Tom Hankinson's in the room. So I don't know if that is going to cause someone to call a meeting to order. Yeah, I'd like to call the Leverett Select Board to order. Great. Thank you, Julie. All right. Sorry, Doug, and I'll Perfect. turn it back to you. All right. So we'll head to that next slide. So you'll notice, uh, just to orient you a little bit, I've got a sort of three color system. Uh, uh, while yellow tends to be caution, it's actually sort of neutral, uh, can be a little cautionary. Uh, certainly red is an area of concern. And so you'll see a lot of red on these next few slides uh, as sort of a stoplight system. Uh, and it's mostly because there's so much unknown. Um, so starting with chapter 70, these, that's our primary source of state aid. Uh, we're at this point projecting no change from our current year. Um, you know, this uh, is, you know, subject for debate at, at the legislative le level. And so, you know, we're hopeful that, that even though there's some enrollment decline this year, uh, there's a lot of unknowns for a lot of school districts about their enrollment for next year. Next year's aid is based on this year's enrollment as of October. Uh, and so that, that could have an impact on us. Uh, but right now we're, we're projecting a, a level funding from, from the state. Regional transportation aid. Um, Regional school districts, because they tend to travel more miles, getting students bus to school, get uh, support for that uh, by virtue of regional transportation aid. That was one of the things when regionalization happened uh, in the 50s uh, that they used as an incentive um, to help the, these districts uh, afford to transport the kids. Uh, it varies year to year of how much uh, the state's able to support that and what level that is. One of the key pieces, though, is how much transportation costs we have to report. Uh, we're going to have less transportation costs this year. It's not zero, uh, but it is it is less by some degree, and that will create less uh, transportation aid to us. We projected about twenty thousand dollars less, uh, and when we get to the chart, you'll see that instead of eight hundred thousand dollars worth of support, it'll be about seven hundred eighty thousand dollars of support. We'll 
refine that number as we go along. Uh, charter tuition reimbursement. Uh, when we send kids to charter school or when kids go to charter school, they choose to go to charter school, uh, we have to pay tuition for that. Uh, in the first years that they go, the state helps ease the burden of that shift. And so they give us a reimbursement to uh, help ease that transition uh, for us financially. Um, we have currently about $350,000 projected for this year in, in, in uh, reimbursement. Um, obviously, on the other side of the coin is what that costs, and we'll get to that in a, in a bit. Uh, but we think, as best we can guess at this point, on what the states told us what they think uh, is going to happen, we're going to hold that number flat. In other words, by virtue of number of kids we think we have and how the reimbursement works, we think that that reimbursement level will be fairly steady from this year to next year. Um, Moving on, excess in END is excess and deficiency. It's, it's uh, in the town parlance, it's called free cash. It's essentially savings. Uh, anytime we have a residual at the end of the fiscal year can go into END. There are caps on how much we can hold. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we try to manage that. We wanna have some of that resource available to us. Uh, we did a more significant spending from that savings account to support this year's budget. Um, we did some, uh, you know, we didn't have as much carryover from fiscal 20, uh, so that will limit how much of, of that we can use to support our budget um, in fiscal 22. Uh, so that's a cautionary uh, uh, and concerning area as well. That could change as well a little bit as far as what's able to support the budget, but we want to be uh, conscientious of using our savings account because that money isn't uh, recurring. It's a one-time uh, availability of use. Uh, Medicaid, we provide services to students uh, that are eligible for Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, they've changed the mechanism by which we uh, file and, and receive that. And so it's, it's a little more complex. It's reduced our, 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 our uh, income from that a little bit. Also being in a more remote uh, circumstance, we provide fewer of those services. So I've made a, a $50,000 uh, decrease in that estimate of, of revenue. Um, it, it is also an area of you know, sort of high unpredictability about how that will play out. Uh, in previous years, we could have counted on generally about $120,000 worth of that kind of revenue. Uh, I think that we'll have a, a, a pretty significantly smaller amount this year. Uh, and so that's just another, another piece of the puzzle from an income standpoint that, that uh, makes it a, a difficult financial year coming up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before I roll forward, just one thing to note, because I know it'll come up that no, the charter tuition reimbursement, no increase in charter. Well, that's negative on the revenue side. That's that's actually a good thing on the cost side. So um, that it it just it comes up a lot because you're you know when we lose charter school students, it, it's a net negative for sure financially. But we it, it actually looks good on the revenue side because we get more reimbursement. So uh, we have seen a, a flattening of charter school out students, and that's overall a good thing for our budget. It, plays out not so well on the revenue side, but on the other side, it, it's a net positive. Um, so I just wanted to, I know it's a, it's a cumbersome explanation, so sorry to do it, but I just think hopefully it, uh, some of you have heard that before, but just wanted to clarify that, but I'll, I'll forward the slide, Doug. Thank you. So on the expense side, um, you know, our payroll accounts, we are, of course, uh, because we just don't have enough complexities in our schedule this year, uh, all our contracts in June 30th of 20, uh, 21 actually our, our food service contract is, is in a single year of continuation from from last year so all of our contracts are, are due for uh, renegotiation uh, so that makes uh, projecting out a little bit difficult um, we've certainly taken a you know uh, our staff is getting a little bit younger we've had a fair number of retirements over the last few years and so uh, more people get steps uh, in our you know salary grid um, but then also we we will have to negotiate uh, whether you know whether and how much there will be a cost of living increase for the coming year and or you know, negotiate the contract as a whole. Um, and so that's one thing that it's working on our, on our budget a little bit and, and has been factored into the, the things I'll show you, but it's a bit of a big unknown. And as that plays out, we'll, we'll uh, continue to refine that projection. The other thing to keep in mind, and this influences our budget in a more subtle way, more along the lines of substitutes, um, tutors that we have to come in for uh, ELL services, that sort of thing, is that the minute state minimum wage is going up to uh, ultimately to $15 per hour. Uh, each January over the last couple of years, it's gone up. Uh, last year, it went up 75 cents per hour. This year, it will go up another 75 cents per hour. Following year, it will go up another 75 cents. So it's, it's progressing at a relatively 
uh, aggressive rate, which is fine. I think it's a, you know the appropriate thing to do, uh, you know, morally for sure. And and so it does put pressure on our budgets in sort of subtle ways uh, that that don't get thought of a lot. But we have, you know, a a a, uh, a number of employees that that are hourly, that are at will type employees. That minimum wage change has an impact on those on those salaries. Um, it's a sort of rising tide lifts all boats circumstance, which is the intention of changing and setting the you know, setting the minimum wage and then changing it in a positive direction. So that also impacts our budget, uh, and we have to account for that. Um, so regular ed tuition. So this is where we come back to where we get charged for some of our charter, and, and the other piece of that is our choice out students, students who have decided to utilize the option of school choice and attend another school or to choose uh, to go to a charter school, and so we get charged a, a tuition there. Um, we think there's going to be you know, a modest uh, increase in what we're currently being charged. That doesn't, you know, the 102,000 that we're predicting there is a 5% increase. Um, you know, that's not the total bill. That's just the increase in the bill. Uh, so it's a it's a pretty significant uh, expense line in, in our budget. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I, you've heard regional school committee members talk about this, of, about the whole of, of uh, how the charter schools are funded and we can, spend a whole day on that, but I, I won't go into that. But nonetheless, it is an expense. We have to you know, keep that in mind. Uh, if there are increases in our number of students that uh, decide to do choice or charter, uh, they do have a relatively, uh, they, they have a negative impact on our, on our budget. Um, now, Doug, if I could add just very yeah, briefly yeah. to that, sorry, is that uh, we'll know more uh, in theory in about a month. Um, so this is a conservative estimate and that's one of the reasons we wanna come back because typically, uh, in late December, we get the charter counts. Um, being that the year it was, it, uh, the state gave um, school districts, including charter school districts, more time to fill in their some of their enrollment information this year. So we may not have that. Usually we come to the January meeting and that number, it's not fixed, it's still a projection, but we have a lot better sense. Right now, I think very appropriately, Dr. Slaughter's having a conservative estimate on that. The reality is this is a huge variable and we just don't know um, because we don't even have the count the counts for this current fiscal year, let alone for next year. So again, these is, this is one of the variables by which we're suggesting uh, that this is a very preliminary uh, discussion today because we, the number of variables is huge that we don't know. That's right. Just to, to paint the picture, a number of things are driven by what are called uh, you know, the October 1 numbers. Uh, so all school districts in the state uh, are required to report student information as of October 1, it's typically due by about the third week of October. Uh, that got delayed significantly, I think, uh, well into November um, by virtue of the complexity of the school year, you know, remote learning and attendance. And, you know, there's a lot of factors that they capture in that data. And so it's it's delayed that, which then delays the ability of the state to 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 uh, sort of run the numbers on these other aspects like uh, charter and, and uh, choice and, and those sort of things. So we're hopeful they'll still be able to to get information to us by the end of December, but it, it may bleed into January a little bit. Um, moving on in special education tuition, you know, it's always uh, an interesting circumstance here. This is something that can change significantly by virtue of a single family moving into the district or moving out of the district. Um, but we think that it's gonna be a fairly modest, uh, you know, our projections at this point is the number of kids we have and the cost that we have associated with that is gonna stay fairly steady. And so we're dealing with mostly a, an inflationary type uh, uh, increase in that, so uh, it's it's not as uh, you know difficult as it might be in in some circumstances. Um, you know, there are years when we know we're anticipating uh, some kids moving into our regional district and and significantly impacting that number, but I, it is not the case this year. Uh, those moving in and those moving out are going to kind of balance each other out, and so it's really how the cost of the programs change that we're trying to factor in there. So it's a, a fairly modest uh, increase for next year. Uh, if you move to the next slide, please. So, um, expense uh, continuing with the expense projections, transportation. Uh, you know, uh, fiscal twenty one was was is the first year of a new contract. So the we typically do a five year transportation contract with our with our busing vendor as well as having our own uh, buses in in the system. Um, that increase from one contract to the next is pretty significant. Usually it was about 10% was the boost. Um, but from a year over year, once you're in the contract, we typically use a CPI, basically an inflationary factor. Um, projecting that's gonna be about a 1% inflation for, for that. So it's a fairly modest increase in our, in our transportation costs, uh, very modest in a lot of ways. Uh, it 
it could be, I mean, it, depending on the nature of how the you know, economic factors play out for this year, it could be, and we've had years where this is the case, where it's actually a negative number, and actually we, we are going to spend less, but we'll see how that plays out. But we're, we're projecting it's likely to go up a little bit, and so that's, that's a, a, a modest increase in our transportation costs. Our health insurance, um, you know, we always take a very conservative approach to what we think is going to happen with health insurance from one year to the next. It's a, it's a fairly large item within our budget. Uh, to offer that benefit to uh, our staff and our and our uh, retirees, um, we think you know we'll start with a five percent increase uh, from what we have right now. Uh, we're hopeful that that will get better as we, as we move along, um, and and hopefully that you know that will will be something that will be moderated a little bit as we go through the process and help ease the burden of, of our uh, uh, our projections of our costs. Um, our pensions, you know, the Hampshire County Retirement Pension uh, is is one we we get, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say dictated to us, but in a sense, they've they've produced their numbers for the coming year of what our assessment is, to based on our retirees and and the folks that we had work for us and and earned that retirement pension, uh, the the increase is seventy three thousand dollars, and about a four percent. Uh, 4.6 percent increase. That's the, probably the firmest number in the entire presentation because uh, that's literally they printed it and sent it to us. This is your number. So uh, that's probably the most uh, uh, confident uh, number I have in the whole the whole of the projections. But it's it's pretty typical to be in that uh, four and a half to even as high as six and a half percent sometimes. But it's it's uh, it's uh, you know a, a number we can hang our hat on for for one of those numbers. Um, so if we could move to the next slide, please. So we'll talk about what, and I've mentioned some of these as I've gone along, what are the things that are, are likely to change? Well, the simple answer is everything, uh, except for our retirement pension costs for Hampshire County retirement. Um, I think the one that's likely, most likely to improve and be a little bit better for us is health insurance. Uh, I'm hopeful that we're not gonna be as high as a 5% increase in our rates. Um, we had low enough claims during the latter part of, of, of last fiscal year that the uh, insurance company gave us a, a, a one half month premium discount. Uh, so the, the uh, employees and the district benefited from uh, the, the cost of uh, uh, the uh, uh, premium was reduced in half one month. So that was a helpful thing for our budget this year and for our employees in their own personal finances. Um, but I'm hopeful that you know our continued uh, Good health of our employees will keep our insurance rates uh, steady and, and not uh, increase as much, and so that's an area that could get much better. And you know, it, the difference in a percentage point can be you know uh, pretty significant on our budget. Um, things that could get worse, or or just are really in some ways, some of this is is more. It's just a, a high level of unknown more than worse necessarily. Uh, chapter seventy is one that's really open ended at this point. I think we're we're uh, you know hopeful that we'll be able to maintain the the level of funding that that we got this year. Um, Obviously, we'd appreciate if they could give us more, but at the same time, uh, we're hopeful that they won't, uh, that it will turn out that we don't have a reduction in that, but it's, it's a bit of an open question still as, as we go along, and hopefully uh, it'll be to our favor. Um, our regional transportation aid, again, I think the question here is sort of what is our, um, you know, there's always the question of how much they're going to, to fund that, or how, you know, what level they're going to fund that, but also it's our, what are our costs going to be? Um, and, and our costs will vary considerably depending on how much uh, transportation we do during the course of the year. So as we go through the spring and, and, uh, and have in-person school or don't have in-person school and how much of that we have will all influence how much uh, cost we have and therefore how much we can ask for in reimbursement. Um, and of course, special education tuition, like I mentioned before, this has, you know, can change significantly uh, by you know, uh, a single family moving in with, with a particularly high needs student. Um, that's just the nature of, of what we have. There are, of course, uh, you know, some remedies in, this, in the state. Uh, they have a, a program called Circuit Breaker, um, and they have an extraordinary circuit breaker. So if you, if you really have an ex a truly high cost uh, circumstance come up, they, you do have some relief in the, even in the uh, current fiscal year. But nonetheless, that's one that can change uh, pretty dramatically at times uh, and, and have a, a profound impact on your, our budgets. And so, I wanted to keep those things uh, in people's minds that there's a lot that can change and will change uh, even over the next you know, few weeks as, as more clarity comes in into the picture here. Um, so if we can move to the next slide where we're gonna get to uh, the assessment methods. And so we take those, um, you know, those uh, 
revenue projections. Well, we start with, you know, what do we think it's going to cost to, to run level services? In other words, taking the programmatic and program, programming that we have in hand and the people it takes to do that, uh, we essentially roll that over to the next year and say, what's that cost to, to do our, our work in the same way we did the previous year? And that's where, where we start. Um, we'll often make ads and cuts to that based on the needs of, of our students and, and our financial needs. Uh, we take into account the revenues uh, that we're receiving, so that transportation aid, chapter 70, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, the difference between those, those inputs of revenue and the, and the expenses that we've calculated, we get an, an amount of money that we're going to assess to each of the four communities. And we have to determine a, mechani a mechanism for doing that. Um, in the original uh, uh, schools, regional schools agreement, the regional uh, regional agreement is a five-year rolling average of our of the students, of the number of students, and we use that for a number of years. Um, and you know, based on the conversations amongst this group of, of towns and, and fiscal needs and advocacy and and uh, that sort of thing, we have gone to a modified. Uh, mechanism of using a statutory method. The statutory method uses uh, a, comp a complicated formula, quite frankly, but it involves both the ability to pay, in other words, income of individuals within a community, as well as uh, the property values within that community, or, or the uh, EQV, as they call it. Um, and it uses a combination of that to come up with, with uh, what the state recognizes as your level of contribution. Um, and so we, we created a split system where we use partly that statutory method and partly our traditional regional agreement method. Um, we were at a 30% statutory model um, with the rest on the regional agreement in, in fiscal 20. Uh, this current year, we, we've moved to a 45% statutory method and, a, and the regional agreement method. And so we're gonna continue to have this debate and discussion about um, what's the right way to pay for things, how does it work, uh, what are the constraints under which we all operate? Um, I think we're going to keep ourselves motivated to do the best we can for the students that are attending our schools. Um, we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll all listen carefully to each other's uh, concerns and constraints. There are differences of opinion. I fully expect that. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a, a few scenarios here that I'm going to lay out as using this sort of mixed model. In a perfect world, we'd get to a place where we have a new uh, assessment method that we can all agree on for a while. I think this is probably not the year that that's going to happen. Uh, way too many things are moving way too much for us to, to have that kind of a de uh, uh, an agreement, I think. But nonetheless, I want us to, to keep in mind, uh, you know, we're all trying to work for the same thing, which is a, an excellent school district and, and, and operate within the realities of all our fiscal constraints. And so um, I'll... Uh, I'll ask the superintendent to switch the next slide. And so this is this is, um, and this is going to be a little tough to see. I hope you can make your way through it. I'm going to I'm going to sort of orient you to the the, the slides a little bit here. Um, each of the colored columns are representative of different mechanisms to uh, pay for the the coming school year. So the left two columns are the last two fiscal years, um, and so. Uh, uh, so fiscal 20, the very first column uh, is at that 30% uh, statutory and the remainder of the assessment done by our, our uh, regional agreement method based on rolling average. The second column is fiscal 21, the one we're in now, which is at a 45% uh, statutory method. And so as we go from left to right, the first column presented for fiscal 22 is at the 45%. The next column is at 55%. The third column is at 65%. The fourth column is if we were to go fully to a 100% statutory method. And when we use the statutory method in each of those four columns, we're using a five-year rolling average of that statutory method. And the reason for that is it mitigates any spikes. Uh, and that's part of why we, we originally uh, had the method of using um, a five-year rolling average of, of, of uh, students uh, because it tends to you know, mitigate any peaks or valleys by virtue of a sudden shift in, in, in enrollment in the, in the uh, classic uh, assessment method and even in, in the statutory method. The statutory method, you, you know, you sort of think about your towns, uh, the value of the property and the incomes of the people that live there don't tend to change uh, significantly year to year, but it's, it's interesting and surprising sometimes to see how, how dramatically those, those numbers can shift year to year for any of the member communities. And so by using an average 
over five years, we tend to smooth that out a little bit, makes those differences a little less dramatic. Um, the fifth column, uh, the sort of light peach color, is the 100% uh, statutory based on a single year of, of uh, statutory numbers. And then the final column is this, the classic uh, five-year rolling average of, of enrollment. Um, and so that's our sort of, you know, uh, in the regional agreement method, that's the method we used in, in years previous to the last few. So going sort of uh, down by rows at this point, the very first row is, is, is the overall budget uh, for level services. Uh, we, we make an assumption about cuts we will need, and part of the choice there is arbitrary. There's no cuts that have been identified. This is, and I'm gonna show another slide with a different level of cuts, um, but the idea here is <clears throat> we recognize understanding what the next check section includes, which is our revenue. So that middle section is the revenues we expect, chapter 78, transportation reimbursement, et cetera, that I spoke of in our, in our uh, uh, previous slides. But that middle section with the revenues reduces, uh, you know, covers some of the cost of our operating budget. And then we, we get down to, to that assessment required line, which is, you know, about five from the bottom. And that line across the board is, is sort of what we're asking each of the communities to, to contribute. And so as we change the number of cuts involved, it changes that assessment required, and then the various methods apportion that cost in those bottom four lines to each of the four communities. And so um, as we, uh, Dr. Morris has switched to the, to the second slide here, which has a $1 million amount of cuts by the district, uh, and you can see how that changes the the assessment and the you know the percentage next to the assessment is the change from fiscal 21. Right Doug um, actually before we transition slides I just want to yeah. note and emphasize for everybody that um, on the first set of slides and this is what I referenced earlier it's going to be a very difficult year trying to balance the percentages of the towns out was not easy um, but I'll do my education piece which is this is a 1.4 million dollar cut to the schools. Um, the schools will not look like the regional schools that people have known for the $1.4 million cut. You know, we've, 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 I think, done thanks to Dr. Slaughter, Mr. Mangano. You can also thank for the shading of these boxes because I think they're the same as the past. So, um, but, but more seriously, um, we've made over a million dollar cuts a couple years ago. Uh, last year was over half a million or in the neighborhood of half a million dollar cuts. There's no, you know, we, we've done everything. We've tried to not, we've reduced administrative staff, we've reduced, you know, curriculum budget lines, all those pieces. There's really not much to cut other than programs and people uh, working with children. So I want to be really blunt about that, that, you know, we, we, I think we've gotten through, it wouldn't say unscathed because we have cut programs, we reduced athletic schedules, we have uh, course offerings that no longer exist for our students at our middle school and high school. Um, at $1.4 million, we're looking at a radically different school system. Um, and so I, I don't mean to deter Doug because he's doing exactly what he should do, which is talk about the financial reality, reality. I have to do the part that I have to do, which is talking about the educational reality. And um, this, this will involve uh, pretty significant cuts, huge impact on class sizes, uh, programs, and I think the viability of our schools in terms of a very competitive market. We've already seen significant reduction of enrollment this year. Uh, some of that has to do with COVID-related items and people making different choices. Um, but at some point, you know, we're well under 900 students at our high school right now. That's the lowest we've been. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's in everyone's best interest that we're attracting those students back. And so uh, I just wanted to do the thing that I have to do, Doug. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, which is, uh, I, I can't look at slides with numbers like this and not emphasize the impact it would have. Uh, on the schools and the viability of them. So Doug can now, I'll go on to uh, a slightly, but not particularly better version, which looks at $1 million of estimated cuts. Um, but that's a nice segue for you, Doug, I think, hope. Right, and and so the idea is that, you know, I mean, the, the first slide was, you know, uh, trying to look at, you know, how do we, uh, given the guidance we've gotten from a couple of communities, uh, sort of, you know, how do we make that work? Obviously that's in the abstract. Um, and so in the concrete, when, when uh, you start to, you know, when, when Dr. Moore starts to think deeply about what that level of cuts starts to mean, uh, as far as what 
what happens in the buildings. Uh, it, it gets to be very, very, very uncomfortable in that regard. Even with this one, which is a million dollars, that's a very large number of cuts. And so you think, well, you know, uh, you know, how is it that we're trying to do the same thing and it costs so much more? And, and there's a number of pieces there. There are, you know, factors outside of control, you know, the cost of things. We have negotiated contracts uh, that involve steps that are, are uh, and, and COLAs that, that have an impact here, uh, you know, the cost of health insurance, et cetera, et cetera, that, that impact that, that cost of doing business. Um, and it's expensive to teach kids, you know, it just is. Um, and, and that's okay in some ways, but we, you know, we will have to make some really, really tough choices about what and who and how we do what we do um, uh, as we go through trying to, you know, reduce our, our, our expenses by a number uh, of this size. Um, and so, you know, we're hopeful that, you know, some of the news in the middle section around revenues gets better, um, or some of our expense lines, uh, you know, come in uh, less than we're projecting. Uh, this is, you know, like I said, a fairly uh, order of magnitude kind of conversation, I think. Uh, you know, the specifics are going to change quite a bit. Um, but I think what you see in, in these slides, you know, with the 45%, which is where we sit currently, um, and a million dollars in cuts to, to what we do, um, you know, that's going to increase Amherst assessment by about uh, less than three and a half percent, if I'm reading it correctly. <laughs> um, but it, but Pelham gets hit with about a five and a half percent increase. And then, um, you know, Leverett and Shootsbury have a very modest about, uh, Leverett about 20, uh, about a 0.2 percent increase and, and, and Shootsbury about a 0.5, 0.6 percent increase over, over the previous year. Um, and so that's, you know, uh, an indication of sort of how this, this plays in and, and how the numbers change from year to year. Um, you know, one of the things that happens, uh, you know, just talking about uh, the averaging, an example of such uh, is, is this, is that your enrollment may drop, but it depends upon uh, not only that, but how the other town's enrollment has changed as well. And so, you know, if you drop your, if your average drops by two students, you think, oh, great, I've got a smaller percentage. But if other communities had a, a larger drop, uh, your percentage of, of, you know, the uh, assessment may go up actually, even though you had a reduction in students. So it's not a, it's not a guarantee if you have fewer students that you'll necessarily have less. Uh, likewise, if you think uh, property values in your town have gone down or stayed steady and not gone up or the incomes of your individuals in your community have stayed, uh, have stayed flat, uh, you know, the interaction with the other four, uh, you know, has an impact on, on sort of what piece of the pie uh, uh, each, each community is, is bearing. So that's, that's the complexity of, of you know, any assessment method, regardless of how we do it. Um, it has that interdependence among the four, the four communities uh, that, that interplays and changes uh, how these look over, over time and also um, even between different assessment methods. Um, so I think I want to, uh, I'm, I'm going to pause for just a second and see if anybody has questions about this, let people digest the, the, the information on, on this a little bit. We're going to go into capital in a moment, which is going to be a fairly straightforward, uh, I think conversation, but I, I want to give a moment because we, we put a big pile of numbers on the screen and I want people to take a second, look at it. If they have questions about these assessment methods, uh, or, or, uh, you know, or about any of the assumptions we've talked about, you know, I would I would love to 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 take those questions at this time for a moment. Yep, and just I, I do want to while we're giving people a chance to potentially raise their hand, uh, do want to apologize that it took me a little while to email this presentation correctly, but it should all be in people's inboxes as well. I see Kathy Shane from Amherst has a question, and Jean as well. So why don't I start with Kathy, and we'll go to Jean. Hi. Um, can you hear me? I turned my mic on. Hi. So I, I wanted to know with when you get to the numbers, Doug, um, that you're projecting. So on enrollment, um, how much we're down in enrollment? You know, you Mike talked about the number. And how much do you think that's because the school is not physically open? Do you have any indication? You know, so would some of those people come back if we were doing in-person classes? So, and, and, and related to that, 
that question about in-person versus not in-person, um, you said in Medicaid uh, that part of the Medicaid projected fall off is because we don't have an in-person contact and how much does that matter? So then my, my third, I'll just give you all three. Um, with the operating budget at a level service, since we will have contracts open, um, can you give us some sense as if, if there were no new increases negotiated, how much would steps alone increase the budget? And, and then what, if, what have you assumed in that budget um, about the wage side? You've already told us about the health insurance side, the wage and salary side, just a, a sense of what's under the um, operating budget uh, before you take the 1 million off or before you take the 1.4 million. So those are my, I think those are my three higher level questions. Sure, I can start, Doug. Yes, please. Um, so we did a survey for families who have uh, left the district um, and this was presented last week. Uh, Kathy, I can send it to you. Um, it, it tried to get at that. I think you're right in terms of the in-person is having an influence. Um, but it was pretty mixed in terms of whether families will return or not. I think I think your assumptions that uh, you made were primary were were borne out in the data that we got back. Um, but I can share that with you or any. It's on our it, it's on our website. But I'll share it with you specifically because I think that question. Doug can definitely answer the question about steps in terms of contractual. Uh, you know any potential uh, impact of colas. Um, that's something that we can't talk about in this public meeting because that would be something that you know the school committee would talk about and then go into negotiations but the step question I think is is a cleaner one for Doug to be able to take a take a try at right um just one follow-up on the on the enrollment question I think you know uh, certainly we've experienced uh you know uh, some kids not coming back and, and part of the rationale for it might be because we're uh, more remote than not um, I think charter schools have experienced that as well choice decisions have changed for families as well. So it, it's complex on, on the reasons why people have made the choices they've made and which ones they've made. Um, and it's also gonna be a, a, a fairly unknown what decision they'll make next year uh, as to whether they'll return or not. I think it's, that's one of the hardest things for us. I think it's also hard for our legislators because they're thinking about, well, you know, how do we fund chapter 70, which has an enroll, you know, enrollment as of October is a pretty significant component of that, of that calculation. Um, and if it's not, you know, uh, reflective of what's going to be, you know, on your doorstep the following year, it's a difficult thing. So uh, I don't envy any of us relative to that. And, and it's, you know, we're trying to sort of plan for uh, some of those students coming back for sure. And hopefully, you know, a, a number of them do. Um, on, the, on the Medicaid question, um, you know, the, uh, you know, we're doing some of that kind of work. I mean, we do provide some of that kind of work even in remote environment. We can do it remotely. We can do, it, we, we have some people going in home and doing some work, um, but it's a much more modest amount, uh, which is why I took a fairly conservative estimate about what we think will generate for, for revenue. It's obviously a lot easier for us to provide those services that are reimbursable uh, when we're in our buildings. Um, there's an economy of, of scale as it were when we have uh, you know, building full of children and, and staff that are in that, those buildings, they can go from one to the next and, and create those, those uh, billable services, essentially. Um, and so it's a lot harder when we're, when we're remote. Um, so we've tried to, to uh, estimate sort of that, that decline as best, as best we can. Um, relative to the steps, uh, you know, it's about, from one step to the next, it's typically about a 4% increase, uh, roughly. I mean, it's, you know, it's not a perfect 4%, but it's about 4%. Um, and then how that impacts the whole of the bottom line across the board, uh, you know, sort of depends on our staff and uh, how many of those we have uh, that are not at the top step. So once you're at the top step, your salary stays the same unless there's a cost of living change, which uh, as, as a superintendent indicated, is a, is, a, is a point of negotiation and therefore something we can't really discuss. Um, but, it, but it does have that impact. So, you know, it's probably uh, the, just the steps alone pushes the overall salaries up, um, you know, I'd say about 3%. I think we've got a younger staff than we've had. So, you know, the, the early numbers are, are pushing in that direction a little bit. Um, uh, don't think you can get all the way to four. Some, you know, some steps are more than 4%, some are a little less than 4%. So, you know, three plus is kind of the, the neighborhood. Um, 
of where I think that that impacts that piece of of our uh, of our expense there. So I, I think that's a um, it's pretty you know it's a profound difference you know from one year to the next. I mean that's a, a pretty significant cost um, that that impacts you know about eighty percent of our total operating expenses are people. You know the people and 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 the benefits uh, of those people, whether it be retirement, uh, health insurance, et cetera. Uh, so that's a you know our 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 you know lights and utilities and and uh, heat and those kinds of things are are a much smaller percentage. And and as the superintendent indicated, we've we've trimmed those. We continue to work on on ways to to do those things and be as efficient as we can and and cost effective uh, in those areas. Um, and for example, you know all the school supply lines that we have for you know buying clay for art class and you know those types of things, uh, you know in projecting next year, uh, those were held level. There was no change in those. Those were held at a at a at a flat level, number, um, and so there's you know no change from the current year in those in those areas. Thank you. I see three other questions. Um, and it's 10.02, so we can do the time check. So I think we'll do those three questions. Uh, my advice then would be, Doug, to very quickly go through capital, because we want to make sure we give time for each time for each town to get into a breakout room and Absolutely. have conversation. But next uh, was Gene. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, as far as the town assessments go, when you talk about house values and income, is it median or average? Oh, you asked me something question. Uh, I'm not sure how they factor income exactly. All right, because it's a big difference. Right. No, I appreciate that. And, and uh, you know, it's it's essentially an ability to pay factor. I would have to look that up. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, right. thanks. And Gene, we can, uh, Doug can get that, and he'll email this whole group on the listserv that I just sent the presentation to, so everyone gets the answer to that question. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Gene. Uh, Mandy, uh, so you were next. Thank you. Um, I just have two quick questions. Um, the first one is related to the charter, not necessarily the reimbursement, but I guess it would be in the budget category, which is with our decline in enrollment this year, the cost per student in our in our budget is is increasing and charter tuition directly relates to the school district's cost per student. So has that um, a, you know that will increase the number the charter tuition going out to charter schools even if the number of students going to charter schools doesn't increase has that been uh, factored into the operating budget line um, so that's my first question and the second one is given that the students are not in school this year I have to assume that the costs for things like supplies as Doug just said and some other things are not as high as budgeted and therefore, I would expect there's going to be a surplus in this year's budget that would end up in the E and D line into the income for next year. How much of that, what is the projected surplus for this year's budget? How much of that is larger than normal projected surpluses? And did you factor that into the use of E and D for next year? Okay, so um, relative to the first question on, on, uh, on change in per pupil expense and how that impacts, uh, you know, I would say at this point, it's not that explicit a, ca a calculation relative to that. Um, I think the, the, you know, obviously it is, you know, how that all works. And, and yet at this point, I think the unknown on how many students uh, even is, is such that it's, it's hard to sort of really uh, crunch that number more specifically. So we're still doing a sort of uh, round estimates of those, those numbers sort of hedge, but that's a, about all we know at this point. Um, on the second relative supplies, absolutely, we're, our, our budgets are currently frozen. So uh, the expenses that we are incurring relative to supplies and that sort of thing is is uh, is being held in fairly tight hold right now. But at the same time, we're still going to you know, buy things for for kids to use, and we do still have supplies and materials that are are uh, going out to kids. Uh, you know, we're spending money on different things. Uh, is, is the other way to put it. So I'm not sure from a surplus standpoint you know, where we're going to land at this point. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but just to sort of paint the picture of supplies, there's still a lot of materials that we get out to students um, and, and are incurring those costs, uh, you know, workbooks and, and uh, 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 in middle schools, you know, uh, you know, doing science stuff. They're getting, you know, science materials out, um, 
you know, they use more commonplace things, you know, that seem odd, like chocolate chips and tea bags and marshmallows, but that's part of how they teach, uh, you know, that science to the kids firsthand. Uh, it's, it's more, you know, real world sort of stuff that they can deal with, less abstract. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're taking on some expenses in other areas. In other words, the way in which we have to get that material to folks, um, you know, we're getting some support from some federal programs. Uh, you know, I'm hopeful they keep uh, you know, on the news talking about the, a second coronavirus relief uh, bill, which would be really good news for us. Um, but there are expenses we're taking on to uh, continue to operate and, 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 uh, and, and teach schools. So from a surplus standpoint, I think it's going to be uh, very modest. And if, if there isn't a second uh, relief bill or if it doesn't include, you know, some pretty substantial support for us, uh, there are there are going to be you know virtually no uh, surplus at all. I think um, you know we have charged a, a number of things in the hope of being reimbursed by virtue of uh, FEMA reimbursement funds or or the original CARES Act funds. They may get rejected, and if they do, uh, we have to eat that cost with our regular budget. So you know some of our supply budget may be buying masks or gowns or you know air filters or whatever. Um, so there's some uh, some other things that sort of eat it at our at our uh, potential for a surplus this year. But any that we have, obviously, we will carry over into E&D and, and uh, help us support future years. Yeah, and I'll just add one thing quick, and then we'll go to Senator Comerford. Um, but thank you for the questions, Mindy Joe. I think the other thing, if you look at like first quarter budget, which has already been presented, um, we, we're, we're at a not so wonderful level as it relates to facilities um, in terms of spending that's gone on so far. But the other one is about... Uh, services related to special education. I think Doug talked about that a little bit earlier, that in a remote setting for some students, um, we've had to, to look at alternative, uh, alternative ways uh, around educating and access to the curriculum, and that, that comes with the cost. And so, you know, we're keeping close tabs on that, and that's why our budget's frozen, to be extra cautious in all the ways you suggested. We know that any dollar we spend this year, uh, particularly as it relates to E&D, means a, a larger cut next year, and that's why uh, about Looks like uh, three weeks ago or so, Doug, I think we froze the budget um, because we are already thinking towards FY21. And while that's challenging in the current fiscal year, we think it's the right thing to do and it's a sustainable model that uh, we're trying to institute and keep our fingers crossed that Washington and other places are able to help a little bit more uh, because we need it. And the last comment or question we'll take before we go to Capitol, Senator Comerford, again, thank you for joining us. Oh well, my goodness, thank you to everybody for your service. Um, I know that Mindy's in here, Rep. Dom is in here very deep as well. I just wanted to let you know on the Senate side, talking about enrollments and the fluctuation of enrollment during COVID and the impact or potential impact of that on next year on the FY22 budget, it's very much top of mind. It's top of mind in the Senate. Again, I know Rep. Dom's in this up to her eyeballs as well. It's also top of mind at DESE, as you likely know, superintendent and, and all. So I, I think this is going to be something we're going to have to be super vigilant about as we go into the fiscal year 22 budget um, on behalf of communities like yours. Um, the other two very, very quick things. You, thank you to so many of you who participated in a DOR DLS DESE study of how we contribute to our schools that was forced, as folks know, in the Student Opportunity Act budget through um, a legislation that we filed and then got it into that. Uh, that study has come out. I'll make sure to get it out to folks. Um, while it's not overall perfect, it does open the door for us to have a conversation about regional equity and the way in which we contribute to schools. Again, not perfect by a long shot, uh, but the conversation's happening. And the last thing I'll just say super quickly is um, I know that many of you share the fact that the Student Opportunity Act was not an overall win um, for Amherst in the way that we want it to be a win. One of the places it really fell short with was with regard to special education. And that's an area that I particularly have become significantly interested in. Um, filed a bill that didn't make it. We're working on another bill now. And uh, because I do think that uh, towns are bearing a burden of special education. Again, I know you want to do excellent education and you are, uh, but that could be much more recognized by the state in equitable ways. So I just want to point that out and it's legislation that's going to go in again in the next session and I'd love to work with you on it. Thank, Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And so I'm going to set a goal for Dr. Slaughter of uh, rolling through capital in five minutes or less um, just because I think otherwise we're not going to give towns 
enough time. And again, these are very preliminary numbers, uh, preliminary numbers for capital. Uh, but we want, again, you have these uh, in an email, but we wanted to at least share what some of the thoughts are. So uh, sorry to push you on that, but I just want to make sure the towns are able to have conversations they need to have. That should be that should be the perfect amount of time. So uh, uh, this is a, a preliminary capital proposal for the coming year of things we would like to do, need to do, uh, you know, maintain our buildings and, and, and grounds. Um, and I won't read the list. You can read those yourselves. Uh, the, the good news about what you see on this list, there's about $400,000 here, uh, is that uh, what we would do is if this moves ahead and we have these sort of identified is that we will uh, we'll have the school committee uh, approve that list and, and get authorization for borrowing. That borrowing would happen during the year next year, and so this wouldn't hit your books uh, uh, till fiscal 24. So that's that's the good news about this list of things is you don't have to start paying for it until fiscal 24, most likely. Um, and it'll probably change significantly like everything else this year. Uh, it's it's uh, We're still fairly early in the process of identifying these things and, and wanting to, to uh, take care of those. Uh, you know, you'll notice objects around, uh, or ideas, uh, projects, I should say, around, uh, you know, air quality and heating and cooling, but also um, some safety things and some uh, ADA work that, that is necessary at, at the buildings uh, and continue to happen. So some of the ADA work, just because uh, that isn't uh, something that was pretty significantly understood to be a need for the district, um, there is some of that work being done with, with operating uh, uh, resources so some of our maintenance budget is is being applied to some of those uh you know easier to fix uh ada compliance issues uh so we're doing that work both with our operating and then also through our our capital planning process um so that's a, a brief outline of, of the projects we're we're expecting to try to work on in, in fiscal 22. Uh, and if you go to the next slide please um this lays out sort of where our debt schedule is looking at uh and so you can see that that the you know the things that are projected um, from f fiscal 22 and you know fiscal 21 will hit in fiscal 22 so the stuff that got authorized last year will hit the books in fiscal 22 that's showing up in the uh, third column and uh, the sort of fifth, fourth block down uh, and then the things from that that I just showed you would show up in the next row down and 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 so you see at the bottom the sort of overall ask of of, uh, of each of the communities um, and if you go to the last slide, please, uh, Dr. Morris. So this is actually how this, those you know, borrowings uh, you know, uh, will impact our, our ask of each of the communities. The assessment method for, for, uh, for debt is prescribed and not uh, under debate for, for uh, a different method. Um, and it is driven by the, the EQV. Uh, and that gets updated every two years. Um, so it just got updated in, in 20, it would only be, so all our pre-existing things that we have uh, taken on debt for are charged at previous year's EQV ratings and, and the appropriate proportion that is uh, associated with each community. Um, and then uh, things that would be approved this year would use the fiscal 20. Uh, so that would hit your uh, financials and change the numbers in, in, the, uh, in the out years of uh, fiscal uh, 23 and beyond. Um, and so the the um, the other thing I will mention here is that uh, most of the debt we are carrying, uh, not all of it, but most of the debt we're carrying uh, is we're doing what's called a ban, which is a bond authorization note. It's a short-term borrowing. It's a one-year borrowing, borrowing. Um, and so we're just doing that borrowing on a one-year basis, pay the entire thing, and then borrow it again. Um, and so uh, the the interest rates on that will change year to year, as opposed to a bond, which is where we get a fixed rate for the entirety of the, of the borrowing. Um, uh, the current ban that we have that will come due in February is at 1.54%. We're hopeful we can get that. I used a much higher estimate uh, because you know, who knows what markets will do in the, in the ensuing couple of months. Um, so you know, that, that will also be an area where this, this number will change ever so slightly based on, on that assumption. Um, and so I think with that, uh, I take any questions on, on capital, but you know, um, it's, it's not terribly exciting. I think the amounts that we're asking for people for next year versus this year are, are you know, a little bit less because we have a little less in our, in our sort of uh, queue. Uh, so we're kind of holding steady for folks as far as the burden of, of capital uh, uh, borrowing for, for the coming year. 
Yep, and uh, before we get to Kathy, uh, just one quick note is that uh, we had a lot of discussion in the past about athletic fields. Um, and you may notice that there's not an athletic field budget item. Some of that was funded to think about a study uh, or feasibility, but part of it's also just the understanding of the town's fiscal reality right now. That um, you heard me make my statement before about what a one 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 million dollar or one point four million dollar cut to the operating budget would do, um, and uh, so it's not that the fields issues have gone away, or the athletic issues um, have gone away. It's just uh, kind of for me an acknowledgement of the reality that uh, we're going to have a hard time on the operational side and making a huge capital ask. While I understand they're separate um, buckets to a certain extent, it's still coming from the towns. And we're trying to be reasonable and responsible um, because you know we know that the operational side is going to be really hard uh, for the district for each of the communities. Um, so it, it is some acknowledgement of uh, of those challenges um, because we're, we're not, you know, it's going to be hard. We're going to be hard pressed to propose a budget that that has a huge uh, cut on the operational side with a huge ask on the capital side. Uh, it would feel very uncomfortable to us. But Kathy, I'm sorry with that long-winded. Uh, qualifier, uh, why don't you go ahead with the question? Okay, I, I have two questions, uh, Mike, and you raised one, but I'll, I'll do an unrelated one. Um, this past year, we at the uh, capital side of Amherst were asked by some high school students to begin a study for solar panels over the middle school and the high school. And it was a fairly low cost. We're talking, you know, 25 and maybe 40 for a more. And it's one that I think, I don't know whether the regional schools want to put it on their list, but doing it and it's still open on maybe we'll be able to afford it out of the Amherst Capital Reserves and get it started. It would lower operating costs. So it's thinking of ways to look forward, you know, aside from what it does for sustainability. So it it has an impact and it's not much money. So it's it's a question of something missing from the list on that one um, to think about. And then the second is on community fields. It those are it's a big chunk of that is eligible from the Community Preservation Act. Um, and uh, on the Amherst side this year, we had a pretty robust CPA set of funds available. And I was somewhat surprised not to see an ask for community fields. And last year you were very modest on the ask, but it's a question on how much um, in terms of next year, you could go for a fairly big ask from CPA that wouldn't would be the study, but beginning to get some work done on the fields um, that wouldn't affect what we're looking at here because it comes from a different revenue source. Uh, it comes from that surcharge. So those are those the two pieces. So, um, I, so with regard to the solar, um, yeah, as I was updating the slide, I had seen that and, and was thinking about it a little bit. And I, I didn't have a conversation with our, our facilities director to see if, if, if uh, he wanted to include that. It may very well be as we come back through this a little more with a fine tooth comb, we'll, we'll get that added back in. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's also a piece of, with something like that, where it sort of, you know, would lay out the, uh, the work that could be done. You also have to then be prepared to do the work because if you wait too long, I've, I've mentioned this, and this is also true with the fields work, is that if you do sort of a design or engineering work, but then you wait uh, a period of time, uh, you kind of have to go back and redo some of that because there's some some aspects of it that 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 don't have a long shelf life. Uh, some things you know do, and and other parts don't. Um, so it's it's a matter of trying to be conscientious of that component as we go through and plan, and you know, sort of when can we execute. A second thing I will say about solar is um, another thing that we have done, and, and this is in Amherst buildings as well as regional buildings. Uh, we've we've partnered with um, uh, the utility company to do uh, lamp replacement. Um, so we've switched out uh, a large number of, of uh, lamps uh, in and switched to uh, higher efficiency, lower energy consuming uh, uh, bulbs in, in our buildings, which is, is hopefully going to impact our, our, um, our, uh, our electric bill um, in, a, in a positive way. Um, the other th good thing about that project is that because it's funded through the, you know, there's a surcharge on your electric bill at your house that helps pay for programs like this. So out of pocket for the district, there was nothing. And, and uh, so it, it, 
was just a matter of uh, coordinating, you know, having the electricians come in and, and do that work. And so that's a, a positive for the for the district as well uh, on a financial sense relative to that. And the one thing I'll add, uh, and then I think I'd like to, unless there's uh, other questions that come in, like to allow the towns to go into groups, is that uh, last year for the second time we applied uh, a couple years ago, the, the towns approved the middle school roof replacement. Uh, they approved the full amount, um, but there was the expectation we were going to go to MSBA and uh, apply for a subsidy. So we did that, uh, and it was rejected now for the second year in a row, and it's just because there's so many roofs. It's not because our roof is not in, in need of replacement. It's because there's so many old roofs in Massachusetts that uh, we qualify when we applied, but when they looked at their money, they raised the, the age of the roof that you need to have to qualify. I think the same thing happened, I believe, in either Shootsbury or Leverett, I apologize, um, but I know they're in the same queue for their elementary schools with the same age roof, I think, as our middle school, and we keep on applying. And if you look at how we apply, we should qualify, but when, when push comes to shove, they say, no, it's not 25 years, it's 27 years that we're, we're only taking. And then, you know, so, so we are getting a little concerned over time. Thank you, Jennifer, sorry, I, I thought it was Shootsbury, I just didn't want to be wrong, um, is um, we, we want to, we are, you know, in that process and we will be reapplying at some point, you know, we've patched together things actually pretty well, thanks to our talented facilities department, but but we're going to have to do something at some point uh, with that. But I did want to let you know that money, that funding was approved has not been accessed. Um, and the school, regional school committee uh, voted for when that project happens um, to have that design study uh, include the potential for solar because that, that will increase the cost. but. Um, you know, for all the reasons that were mentioned earlier by, by our students and community, we thought that was really important. And that was a vote that was taken over a year and a half ago. It's just, we're stuck in the MSBA queue. And as they keep on raising the age of the roof, our roof only gets one year older each year. But unfortunately, the MSBA expectations is this, you know, we need to get older quicker uh, to qualify. So hopefully that levels off. But I see there was one more question, and I apologize, but I think that's the only uh, additional question we'll take before we get groups uh, going. But I think um, Darcy Dumont, uh, Councillor Dumont had a question, so you have the floor. Sorry, um, I, I just wanted to uh, bring up the the solar issue again. Uh, thank you, Kathy um, and Mike, for for mentioning that. Um, on the issue of the um, district offices parking lot resurfacing at the middle school. Um, you know, part part of the um, resident capital request was with regard to putting canopies on the middle and high school parking lot. So I would hope that, that whatever is being planned there um, factors in the possibility of, of um, how it might end up being canopies there rather than just straight uh, parking lot resurfacing. Okay, thank you. Um, feedback on that, and we can, we can talk about that. That's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I'll mention just about that resurfacing is it, it really becomes, uh, you know, the, the reason why it is on the list is, is, is not because it's about people's cars as much as about when they're walking from the car to the building. Uh, it's a it's sort of health and safety issue relative to the lot. It's in, it, It's got some areas that are in pretty rough shape, and uh, but nonetheless, the, the feedback around the solar is certainly something we'll, we'll keep in mind. I don't think anything we were planning on doing would preclude that, but obviously, um, you know, if we have in mind that that's a potentiality that may Im impact how, how and what we do. So at this point, I want to do a sort of, I'm going to, so we can see each other a little more now. Um, I want to pause us and just check in about whether each town has clarity on a breakout group. Again, if a town needs help from me, I'm happy to set one up, but we thought each town would be able to do that. So I'm going to turn to Paul for the town of Amherst. Um, do you have any directions you want to give? I see a thumbs up. Um, you can definitely put it in the chat if any of the member boards you know, didn't get that information. Um, for Pelham, is there any assistance needed to set up a breakout room? Uh, no, thanks. We're all set. Okay. And for the town of Leverett? I think we're all set. Shootsbury? Um, so, Paul, just I would make sure that the school committee also has, the Amherst school committee members also have that link. Um, 
Jerry's all set. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna hang out on this line. Uh, if you wanna put it in the chat for any town, you know, we'll just all respect that we don't go to each other's town, right? We're, we're, we're all mature adults here and we'll, we'll make sure we do that. Um, if, but I'll be here if anyone's having any trouble so I can connect, uh, connect anyone their way. But I think if you can put a Zoom link or whatever the link is in the chat, that might be helpful for everybody. Um, but I see there's one question and I'm assuming it's on this topic of uh, how to get there, Bethany. Uh, Dr. Boris, I'm just curious. Uh, I know the breakout rooms are a chance for our town's boards to talk. What feedback are you hoping for today? Or are you hoping for any feedback? Sure. So um, thank you for that. I uh, appreciate it, Brittany. So uh, Bethany, excuse me. So I don't, um, I think at this point, it's more just reaction response. Uh, you know, again, where we started, there's too many variables, we believe right now, to be looking for yay, nay. You know, I think if there's creative ideas that people want to have, could you look at this method or could you do this? That's the kind of thing. But we're not looking for any thumbs up, thumbs down, even thumbs to the side today, because uh, we don't feel like we've given you enough information uh, for folks to respond to that way. Uh, so it really, it's just a chance to, to process the information from a town by town perspective. Uh, and if there is feedback or ideas you want us to do next time, you please come back with X method or what would it look like? That's the kind of feedback we're looking for. Not really looking for anything more than that. Hopefully that helps, but thank you for the question. I should have been more clear and reconvene. I would like us to reconvene, um, I was going to say 1045. I think that's probably unreasonable for what I can Okay. Um, so um, this meeting will be open. Um, you don't need to exit it unless your computer tells you uh, you need to. That's up to you and your computer. But I'll stay on this meeting. It'll stay open for anyone who's struggling. And let's come back at 1050. Um, and really, we're just going to hear very briefly from each town and close at 11. So. Uh, I'll be here if someone feels like their town's ready at 1045, you can let me know. Um, but let's no later than 1050 and we'll end by 11. Uh, if you need to leave this meeting, that's fine, but that's up to your device, not, not because it's a problem for me. Thanks, everybody. Um, appreciate it. Um, and so, you know, again, we only have 10 minutes left. Uh, what I'd love to do is just uh, give each town uh, an opportunity to go around the room um, or go around the room to the different towns. And just a quick, you know, questions you have, responses you have that we'll take notes on. We're not going to do dialogue back and forth today because of the timing and because of the kind of scarcity of, of hard data that we were able to present today. Uh, and then we'll close and we'll be back again, I, I would imagine, sometime in late January, mid to late January. Uh, we'll be the next four town meeting. Again, we'll, we'll follow up with you via uh, email on that one. But we started backwards at the beginning. We'll start forwards this way alphabetically. So. Uh, I'll turn to Lynn or Paul. I don't know if any who who wants to share a bit from the town of Amherst's perspective. Uh, this is Andy. I was uh, selected by the uh, uh, council to uh, be the presenter for Amherst, and uh, so I'll just proceed with uh, making several different points. One is that it was reported at the beginning of the meeting that our guidance was um, level funding, not level services. And um, I'm going to um, ask the, our finance director participate for a moment to explain that. But I want to um, do start by just saying something on process, and that is that um, you know we're in a very different form of government now and have a very different process. That we started the process with the um, finance director and town manager making recommendations on what we could anticipate in revenue and expenses. And uh, then it goes to the Finance Committee of the Council. The Finance Committee of the Council will uh, take all of the information we have, including consideration for this meeting, make a recommendation to the Council on budget guidelines, and the Council will adopt budget guidelines um, in late December or early January. Um, but uh, the preliminary recommendation, which we have gone over in great detail, and Sean can explain a little bit more on, um, is the uh, that we are not in a position to um, do more than level funding um, for all 
areas and it's not just regional schools it's all town departments it's library it's elementary schools and we recognize that those are have significant impact across everything it affects what we can do for our homeless population exploit the public safety um, it, what we can do in public works but it, it is a significant across the board thing and the, um, the schools including the regional schools were not treated differently in that preliminary recommendation um, other things that um, we have um, thought, and, and it, this gets to the recognition that level funding and level services are significantly different. Um, we did have some discussion in our breakout meeting about capital, um, and uh, we want to have uh, more discussion in a future four towns meeting about that, including uh, Community Preservation Act uh, uh, and how. Um, CPA from all four towns might help address the uh, serious situation in the safety of our uh, athletics uh, program using current fields. And um, uh, I think that when we um, come back for the next meeting, <laughs> we're looking for a lot more of a description and a, a real understanding of how the um, cuts the, that were proposed in what you said, Dr. Morris, about um, the, their real impact on education, that we really need to have, uh, are looking forward to a, a more robust understanding of that. And then uh, the final point that was made in our breakout meeting was that uh, the lack of in-school um, teaching is really affecting um, how we can get support for schools and um, that uh, we really need to get back to in school teaching in order to make sure that we have support. Dr. Uh, so, um, uh, Mr. Mangano, do you have anything that you can say real quickly on this subject? I'll be, I'll be super brief. Um, we have three major challenges that we're dealing with and some of the other towns have the same ones and some are unique to Amherst. Um, the first one is our, our local revenues um, and the impact of the college depopulation on our enterprise funds, on our, our you know, all the, the local economic revenues that we get from hotel usage, restaurant usage, parking. Um, we saw, you know, roughly a 30% reduction in our budget for that area for FY21. And we just don't know where that's going uh, in the future until we get more stability. Um, the second one is capital. We One of the ways we were able to get our FY, FY21 budget um, move forward is by reducing capital. And we really pushed a lot of capital needs off to FY22. And so that's an area that's a high priority for us is getting back on track for capital, which affects all departments, um, including the regional schools. So, and then the, the third one, which I know everyone shares is uncertainty around future state aid. Um, you know, I've heard Mr. Uh, Town Manager Bachelman say several times, you know, towns are really a lagging indicator. The revenues we get are a lagging indicator of what's going on in the state. And so the potential for future state aid to be less than what it is now or, or very limited uh, growth is something that we considered when we put together our initial projections. So I will end it with those, those three things that we're, we're thinking about a lot. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, we'll go in alphabetical order, so I'll go to Leverett next. And, and I wanna actually, before Leverett jumps in, I wanna say the same thing, and it's a good correction that the the guidance they received both from Amherst and Leverett was across departments. It wasn't specific to the regional. So my apologies and the, the same should be said of Leverett and my apology for the lack of clarity on my statement. Um, and, but we'll go to Leverett, sorry about that. Um, Julie, if you're trying to speak, uh, you're not muted from my end, but we can't hear you. You also happen to be upside down and I'm not quite sure why that is. We still, unless it's something me, but I don't think it is from the faces I'm seeing, I think we still can't hear you. Sorry, Julie. She might need to exit and come back. Yep, so Julie, an idea might be to exit the meeting and come back or have another representative from Leverett um, share thoughts.
Well, while Julie's doing that, why don't we go to Pelham and then we'll come back to Levered after Pelham um, when hopefully the technology problems are resolved uh, but for Pelham. John Tricky, I'll speak for Pelham at this point. Um, the numbers that are presented for the budget, uh, I think Pelham would be, could fund uh, the 55 or 65 percent uh, statutory. Um, you went, we went down 24,000 this year from the budget and we did not, we took it off the, the whole budget for the town. We did not uh, replace it. So uh, the 24,000 we had originally budgeted on top of that would put us about where we need to be anyway. So those two numbers, 55% or 65% statutory would work for us. Thank you, John, I appreciate it. Uh, I see Julie is now, Let's see if Julie, Julie, are you ready to, Share more and see if we can hear you this time. On my screen, you look right side up, but frozen. Um, see if there's, um, while we're waiting for that, there are some comments from Doug and Sean uh, to answer a question that was asked earlier in the meeting. Uh, Bethany, do you wanna um, jump in here from yeah. Leverett? Um, I don't want to speak for Leverett, um, I'd rather Julie or Tom do, but what I was wondering just for Pelham, when they say 55 or 65% stat, uh, is it for the 1.4 million cut or the 1 million or does that not matter? I'm just curious about that, if you could clarify. We would prefer the 1 million, but if it's the 1.4 to keep the school going, um, we need to keep the regional school functioning. So really up to that all four towns agree what the cut would be, but I think moving the statutory to the 55 or 65 is important. Thanks, John. And Julie, are you with us now? Can I think so. Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. Um, so we really have nothing to add at this point um, until there's more data. Um, so that's okay. basically it. We really have no real comment. Um, we just go along with the, the current assessment method at the 45% and, um, you know, wait to weigh in when we have more information. Thank you, Julie. Thanks for Leverett. And Shootsbury. Hello, I'm uh, Bob Groves. I've been selected uh, to, to, to speak to you about this. Uh, we have some we have all the pressures that the rest of the towns have. I won't go into that, except we do have some uh, rather unique pressures uh, in Shutesbury. Our tax rate was bumping up against the ceiling of over $24 a thousand. And uh, last year we were able to provide a little relief to our taxpayers by uh, putting some free cash against uh, the levy so that we uh, reduced the tax rate to, from $24, and I think 35 cents to 22.51. But that is not sustainable. Uh, we can't continue to to do that uh, for various reasons. One of which is that we have major capital projects uh, that are coming up very soon. The school roof, as was mentioned, and a big culvert project up on the lake, which are going to total somewhere north of two million dollars. So, uh, given all that, uh, we uh, continue to support moving um, significantly towards the statutory method, which our taxpayers want us to do, and. Um, we, we've gotten plenty of news about that, and we are happy to have made incremental change in that department last year, but we expect and hope to make further change this year uh, uh, towards that goal. I guess that's about all we have to say at this point. Okay. Thank you, Bob. So 1102, not terrible. Uh, we try to end on time, not too bad. Um, so the next steps are we'll take all this feedback. We'll, we'll let people know we'll be back sometime in late January. At that point, we'll have more information, both locally and, and potentially at least initial information from the state. We'll also, to the point of having more uh, a clearer picture of what budget cuts of this magnitude would do uh, and how they would affect the regional school experience for the students from all four communities. And really, I just want to thank you for spending, now it's really snowing here, even in, in uh, the middle school. So uh, let people off to their snowy Saturday. Uh, but again, thank you where we started. Thank you for all the work that you're doing and all the thinking you're doing in very precarious times fiscally uh, to support the regional schools and, and to support each other in, in this venture of a regional school system. Um, I think we'll just, I'll, I'll, with your permission, assume that all the elected bodies are going to 
uh, end their meeting now so you don't have to do the formality of it. I see nodding heads, so people are comfortable with that. And go out and enjoy the snow this afternoon. Take it easy. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.